um, um, yeah. Uh, area of interest, she's interested in doing research in psycho-oncology, psychotherapy, and psychopharmacology, and screening for the distress in cancer patients. So the, the presentation today is about the um, depression, burnout, and the heart. So over to you, Professor Michelle. Please yeah, answer. thank you so much, Daria, and thank you, Reiner, for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I am a, a, a psychiatrist in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan, which is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's about three hours by car uh, east of Chicago, um, so it's a college town. And uh, right now, the University of Michigan is playing football against Penn State, which is a very big game in this in the United States. And I'm not sure what the score is, but so I'm a consultation liaison psychiatrist, and which means that I work with patients who have psychiatric uh, illnesses, but also have co-occurring medical or surgical uh, uh, conditions as well. And so, uh, although I uh, my main focus clinically is in the in the oncology uh, uh, world, I'm a psycho oncologist. I also am very interested in other areas of consultation liaison psychiatry. And so, for a long time, we worked in the area of psych cardiology. And so, I'll be speaking to that today. Uh, I received royalties from a number of publishers and a, an honorarium as section um, editor and now chief of, uh, uh, editor in chief of the journal Current Psychiatry Reports. Thanks. Next slide. All right. Go on. This is a bit coming. Thank you. So, um, about uh, 12 years ago, uh, we published a book um, uh, by Wiley, it was published by Wiley, and it was called Psychiatry and Heart Disease. And my other editors were Lawson Wilson, who's an internist and psychiatrist in Ohio, and Mel Rubenfire, who's a cardiologist here um, at the University of Michigan, and Divya Ravindranath, who's now a CL psychiatrist in California, but he was a fellow at the time. And so we were very interested in various uh, cardiac conditions and their relationship to heart disease. And, and you know, that that really uh, was a, a great um, opportunity to work with cardiologists and electrophysiologists and cardiac surgeons on various topics uh, related to psychiatry and heart disease. But, no. You want the next? Next, yeah. Um, we also did a number of books uh, with Springer, and one I did with Linda Lamb was about physical exercise and interventions for mental health. And in that book, there were also a lot of um, aspects related to stress and heart disease and psychiatric conditions. A couple of years ago, Kirk Brower and I did a, a book on phys physician mental health and well-being and talking a lot about stress. This was pre-COVID. I should say all these books were pre-COVID. And so uh, we we started talking about burnout and physician mental health um, at least about five years before COVID. And we, start, we tried to lay out a blueprint for how we might wanna do research in this area of physician mental health and well-being. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Sagar Parikh and John Graydon, who is the former chair of the University of Michigan, we've been very interested in mental health in the workplace uh, where there's a lot of stress. And with that stress, just like in physician mental health and well being, stress leads to um, errors and safety issues. And so, um, a very important area for us in psychiatry in terms of um, public mental health. 
And we have a book coming out by, Spr you know, Springer is going to be the publisher on depression, burnout, and suicide in physicians. So I've been very interested. Um, I'm not trying to sell any books here, but I've been very interested in the area of stress, um, mental health, physical health, and ways to prevent um, these conditions and, and what to do and how to manage it if it occurs. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So what are the, the key themes that we're going to talk about today regarding stress, mental health, and cardiovascular diseases? One of the issues that you'll see in many of the slides is that all these issues overlap. And so it's been very difficult to tease apart what the what the origins, what the chicken and egg issues are with these these conditions. And so um, looking at this longitudinally and with the right markers um, is very important. And you, so you, when you look at studies, you have to sort of see how long they last and and what was the precursors to uh, people getting mental health stress and cardiovascular diseases. Are there is there an impact of psychosocial factors on cardiovascular diseases? The answer is yes. And then are there problems in screening and treatment for those people who have stress, mental health, and cardiovascular diseases? And yes. And we really don't have workable uh, solutions right now. So I think this is an important topic, Reiner, that you chose for us today. And I hope, you know, we can continue to to talk about this in some of the the um, writings in the journal and other presentations in future conferences. Okay, next slide. So, uh, depending on how much you know about mental health, you know this is a slide that I use from the National Inst National Alliance for Mental Mental Illness here in the United States, pointing that out that here in the United States and really worldwide. Uh, there's a large uh, predominance of mental issues. And some of it is minor, um, such as, you know, one in five adults have some sort of mental health problem. One in 20 have a serious mental health problem. And also um, the, the issue is that a lot of adolescents do, and those who are in minority groups, those who have LGB, who are LGBTQ, uh, all those who are impoverished, impoverished, less education. Um, and the, the map of the United States doesn't, those pictures don't, the uh, colors don't mean that that's where those uh, problems occur. It just shows that it gives you a percentage of, of how many people have what percentage of people would have that those conditions like one percent have schizophrenia one percent have bipolar disorder or, or personality disorders and so it gives you a sense of um tries to compare uh using colors um the percentage and predominance of various mental conditions next slide oh sorry nothing good yep so when we're going to be talking about depression and cardiovascular diseases, it's very also important to talk about stress. And I should note that the word stress really isn't a medical disease. You know, it's not a disorder. And so it's interesting because we use it all the time. Um, we, we ask patients, how stressed are you? And without a really good, um, if we can go back, to the other slide, if 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 we if we um, if we think about it, we're really not using a measure uh, that we all understand. Now, you, you know, there are stress tests that we use in cardiovascular health, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about psychological stress. So many of, and you'll see that this is February 2023. So this was, you know, really post COVID, uh, but. Many of us feel stress, and certainly with world uh, uh, world trauma and politics, and um, you know other other major issues in the world that contributes to us feeling stressed, both physically and mentally. And many of us have, you know, have trouble falling asleep because of stress. 
So this term stress is, you know, a very interesting one, and maybe we can come back to it later if we have time in the question and answer. Next slide. And as I mentioned before, there's so much overlap between stress, um, mental health, and cardiovascular disease. So if you look on the list of those people who say they are stressed and what 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 they feel regarding stress, you can see that many of these issues would be overlapping with anxiety, with depression, um, and with physical symptoms like indigestion and appetite changes, with all, which also can be related to depression. So it's very complex, especially if cardi cardiologists or surgeons are using various tools to decide whether or not to send somebody to us um, in psychiatry for mental health care. Next slide, please. And this is a, a, a picture from a cardiovascular um, magazine. Uh, and the cardiologist is talking about stress being your worst enemy. And it's not from a stress test, but that stress stress related disorders um, can can increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure. So it's really quite circular and it's very hard for a patient to try to figure out which is the beginning and which is the end and what to do about it. Next slide, please. So this was from a European uh, Society of Cardiology. Uh, it was a 2018 position paper on depression and coronary heart disease. And you can see that it's there, that there are many uh, topics that from a, from a pathophysiological point of view, and basic science up to psychosocial issues, you know, my, micro and macro issues. And so uh, one has to take this all into account when thinking about stress, heart disease, and, um, and mental health conditions, in particular, depression and anxiety, stress. Next slide. So, We've always recognized that there are diagnostic dilemmas uh, in medically ill patients, and whether it's uh, reactive to a life circumstance, like, let's say after a heart attack and, and worrying about uh, those symptoms coming back, if it's PTSD, when somebody has panic, you know, a few months after having an MI, um, to People who are medically ill, let's say with cancer or heart disease, may be depressed. And is that normal to be depressed when when one has grave illness? As well, there are also vegetative symptoms in depression and anxiety, but could be related to the medical condition or the treatment for that condition. And often the terminology is not precise when we ask somebody about uh, fatigue or or uh, appetite, so so it really um, begs the question: Are we, you know, how we treat people if we're not going to be precise about the language, and when all these conditions really um, overlap one another? Next slide, please. So what about the prevalence of depression and anxiety and cardiovascular disease? Well, it's really quite high. And we know in our, with our patients uh, in our psychiatric clinics that often depression and anxiety travel together. So again, it's very hard to tease apart, um, but anxiety is quite high in people who have cardiovascular disease. And this is, you know, in general, as well as depression. So about a third of people, if you use uh, scales, uh, which may in themselves have difficulty, uh, about a third of patients with heart disease 
say they're anxious and about 20% say that they have depression based on the scales we use. So this is really quite high and it's three times greater than, than in the general population. So it behooves us to really try to recognize this and try to try to reduce those rates. Next slide, please. There's also a predictive influence of depression. It's, it's not just that people have heart disease and they get depressed. Um, clinical depression itself can be a predictor for the development of heart disease. So if you follow a group of patients over time who who have de who have clinical depression, especially from youth or in their early twenties to to more in their middle age or later, there's a strong correlation with depression and increased heart disease, and that could be that could be direct or indirect causes to that. Next slide, please. Interestingly, if one has depression and anxiety, it also can can act uh, as a marker for response in heart disease. So if you're depressed at baseline and then you you also have some stressful life events in the eight weeks prior to the heart disease, it, it portends poor response to the treatment for that heart disease. And, and that may again be direct or indirect. It could be that the depression causes one to have less interest in physical conditioning, uh, watching one's appetite, following the recommendations of the healthcare team, but it also increases the mortality after cardiac surgery. So the, this is why it's so important to try to, to figure out a, a way for us to screen for this and treat it and manage it. Next slide, please. Um, the American Heart Association put out a statement um, in 2014, and they reviewed studies and they did a lot of meta-analyses, and um, they said in, the, in this scientific statement that the de Depression is an individual risk factor for adverse medical outcomes in patients with acute coronary syndrome. So they themselves and the, and the American Psychiatric Association actually sponsored this scientific statement as well, that there's a clear reason uh, uh, to screen for and treat and manage depression in, in heart disease. Next slide, please. And where many of us are aware of the uh, uh, the studies that were done um, initially in Canada um, um, about myocardial infarction and the impact of depression, anxiety, and stress the year after, at least the year after the uh, am I and then longer term and it was interesting um, pre-myocardial anxiety in the couple of hours before the MR, M, MI showed an increase of in a 10-year mortality rate in those over 65 so they died sooner and those who were had moderately high stress at the time of the myocardial infarction there was a increased two-year mortality and inc increased risk of having angina in the following year after the um, myocardial infarction. So again, this anxiety and the stress is important to recognize and respond to for our patients. Next slide. And again, depression uh, portends a twofold increase in mortality fo following a my myocardial infarction and also heart failure. So in the book that we did uh, a number of years ago, we really tried to look at the various heart conditions, let's say heart failure, congestive heart failure, congenital heart disease, um, 
am I, for example, and trying to give the statistics and the data about each of these conditions, because they are different. Sometimes we try to uh, put them together, but they are, are quite different because the treatments are different. Next slide, please. And after an acute, the enriched study was very important. It, um, it looked at um, coronary heart disease and showed that there's an increased risk of all cause mortality after 30 months and five years of, a, of acute coronary syndromes. And it persisted after they had tried to adjust for confounders like various socioeconomic issues. So again, depression really stands out as an important risk factor for mortality after various heart conditions. Next slide, please. So, you know, how much of this is related to behavioral aspects in depression and heart disease? So certainly poor health behaviors, so physical activities like the book that Linda Lamb and I did about physical activities, poor diet, um, obesity is, is a, a marker for many um, medical conditions and causes a lot of adverse uh, problems and increases mortality. Diabetes, hypertension, and poor sleep are all behavioral aspects that will certainly um, need to be treated and may be related to depression and anxiety. And often in uh, when cardiologists and patients to, um, you know, after a heart attack to various uh, programs, um, a lot of these behaviors are targeted uh, in terms of exercise and nutrition and um, you know, weight reduction as they should be. Okay, next slide, please. So I I hope we can sort of see that there's a, you know, a bi bi-directional approach that one has to think about between depression, anxiety, and heart disease, that one can lead to the other and the other lead to, to the next. And so it's really bi-directional and, and waiting till somebody's in their 60s or 70s, for example, is, is probably too late. It's really, we really need to look at youth and, and behaviors and genetics and family history, uh, et cetera, from, from, from a young age, um, not, not until later, later years, which often is what we do. Next slide, please. So this is a biopsychosocial model. This is Josh Hare, and it's used a lot when one thinks about the relationship between depression and heart disease and stress. And you can see in the various colors how one leads to the other and it's bi-directional. And uh, sort of, you can see how many um, factors go into thinking about heart health and mental health and physical health. And probably one could use this for a lot of other major medical conditions like diabetes, heart, uh, hypertension, et cetera. Next slide, please. And the American Heart Association gives recommendations about how to screen for depression. There are no screening um, re recommendations from the American Heart Association for anxiety. But this is the screen that that is recommended. And you can see that it was a PHQ-8, not a PHQ-9. So they left, left off the suicide question. But this was how to divvy up the PHQ-8 uh, using minimal symptoms of depression, mild to moderate and major depression and what to do in a sort of a graphic form. And the next slide um, is who should be screened? This is the American Heart Association. So all patients should be screened is the recommendation after an acute uh, cardiac event or having a chronic cardiac problem like congestive heart failure. And the screening should be within a month of the acute 
cardiac event. Um, and then annually, depending on, on, on the uh, results of that uh, screen and the heart disease. And then you should be screening for high risk populations, those who are suicidal or changes in mood and then screening two months, rescreen somebody after the acute event when it's negative in the first screening. So this is what's recommended. And the next slide. Second. Um, one could also use the PHQ-2 to start with in, in various clinics. And you're asking about depressed mood in the past two weeks and anhedonic capacity in the past two weeks. And then you would go on to PHQ-9 or other screening tools that you might want to use for depression and the severity of the symptoms. Next slide, please. And this would be the PHQ-2 if one wants to use it as a beginning tool. Again, this is for cardiologists um, and they're very busy clinics. Doesn't say who should do it in the clinic or really what should happen, but it, it's really a guide. The American Heart Association gives a guide to how to screen for depression. Next slide. And just to remind us, this is the PHQ-9 and the abstraction of the PHQ-2 in that. Okay, next slide. And these are the, at the scores, how you would score it. And here in our clinic, we, we do that each time we see a patient, it's part of the medical record. Next slide. So again, the American Heart Association, no specific screens for anxiety. Um, and it may be related to the high prevalence of anxiety in that a lot of times the um, panic or generalized anxiety could, could be like a, um, a mask for angina and myocardial infarction. So you really don't want to get high, high false positives or false negatives. And uh, certainly in a lot of emergency departments, they even have sort of a chest pain clinic because there's so much overlap between anxiety um, conditions um, and heart disease symptoms. And it, it's really very problematic sometimes to screen for these and not, not spend a lot of money and time and anguish for patients. Next slide. So what about the management of depression, anxiety, and stress in cardiovascular disease? Well, if you have very patient-centered approach to this, you would want to think about cardiac rehab and exercise therapy, and that's often what's given to patients after an acute event. You'd want to think about cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and that's, mm -hmm. oh, could you go back? Yeah, sure. You, yeah, you you want to think about cognitive behavioral therapy to try to to try to um to as a modality for for psychotherapy and depression. You want to have a disease management management program and how to uh, evaluate and um and treat the depression. And then pharmacotherapy. What's safe for that kind of patient and that cardiovascular condition? And and um, and so that that was what was uh, recommended by Josh Hare and others in 2013, and it was published in the Euro Journal of Euro European Heart. Next slide, please. But there are many barriers to the screening of depression and heart disease. So uh, it turns out that only about 6% of patients are approached by their physician for depression treatment within the cardiovascular setting. Um, and a very few receive psychotherapy and very few receive medication therapy. And that's 
very true today. This was in 2020, but this is very true today. In a very busy heart heart clinic, um, even though there is there may be screening, very few patients actually get get a um, get step care. Next slide. And it may be that we've asked too much of our colleagues. You know, they um, they're very busy. And even if they screen for depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress or bipolar disorder, it, it's very difficult for them to ensure that the patient will get the, the mental health care that is needed. Um, it's hard for them to track. Many patients come from different geographic distances. And um, it may be a lot to ask in terms of knowledge uh, of our surgeons and other cardiac specialists. Um, and as was noted, there isn't really an anxiety tool that we're asking them to use or a PTSD tool, or, you know, we're asking them to do a short version of the, D of the PHQ. And so who should really be in charge of the screening uh, system and making sure that this the screening is reliable, accurate, and then getting the patient to the right care. And that's really the, you know, the major, major elephant in the room for this conversation. And this was published in 2022 in um, circulation, um, cardiovascular quality outcomes. Next slide, please. And uh, for the patient, you know, what's normal? What are they supposed to feel like if they have chronic heart failure or other heart disease. Um, and a lot of them are uncomfortable discussing it. Um, it. It may be a lack of peer support where they don't wanna talk about it. Maybe they don't believe in the validity of the screening instruments. And uh, you know, there's still a lot of stigma around having depression. So there's a denial of symptoms or a confusion about whether the symptoms are related to the heart disease or, or a psychiatric problem or both. Next slide, please. So this was an interesting article that was um, came out of Columbia University. Um, and they really did a deep dive into looking at depression screening in cardiac patients. And it turns out that really, we don't really have a good model, at least in the United States, but we don't have a good model of how to ensure that patients who have cardiac disease are adequately screened and will get to adequate care and that there will be a feedback loop between the mental health provider and the cardiologist and primary care doctor and with the patient and with patient-centered care. And um, so this is the next big challenge on how we, you know, in a very, in, with many, many patients post COVID, how we, how we can try to figure out a good system of care. Um, and, you know, it's a very, very interesting and difficult and complex topic to address. And, um, and I think that's the last slide, except we can see the next slide, uh, just the thank you slide. So I think I'm done and we can open this up to questions and answers, I guess. Correct. Right. We know where the, our chair is gone. Claudia. I don't know if he's not there. I'm, I'm always wondering, um, one thing is that um, females and males are slightly different in their response to anxiety, depression, and uh, yeah, cardio uh, cardiological disease. So usually when you would expect that one or whatever thing is related, stress is also gender uh, different, you know, so what what would you say about the impact of uh, gender differences in, in your... Um, yeah, day. well, that's a very good question, Reiner. You know, for many, many years, women 
uh, weren't even studied adequately. You know, women of childbearing ages weren't even studied adequately by National Institute of Health. And so it's only been in the last, you know, 20 years or so that women have actually been able to be participatory in research projects in general. Um, there's a, a large data uh, base about women being underrecognized uh, or not recognized the same way as men in emergency departments or with heart disease, because often it was called atypical, but it's really more typical for women. We just really weren't uh, addressing it the same way. And, um, and it's true that men have been treated differently in terms of cardiovascular studying. Many women don't get annual stress tests. They don't get annual EKGs. You know, they were never really seen in the way that men were in terms of at risk for heart disease, yet they really are. We realized during COVID that women felt much more stressed than men, you know, uh, and, and, and so, you know, that wasn't really taken into account in, in, in very many ways in terms of caring for women, um, either, you know, psychiatrically or medically. So, you know, these are all very important gender uh, biases about men versus women, and then race comes into it, ethnicity, and, um, and you know, it speaks to the way we, you know, we, we think about categories of people in different ways, and it really does affect how we uh, screen for and manage patients. Um, uh, and often make mistakes. You know, it, it goes back, you know, centuries about women being hysterical. And, you know, we, we ha even have words, for, you know, we even use, you know, hysterectomy and, you know, different terms for this that were very pejorative and probably miss many uh, medical conditions in women because of the prejudices that we've felt towards, you know, men and women over the years. So these are good questions. But, you know, I I I think the and certainly in the area of stress, we know that many women feel stressed at home and many men at work feel very stressed, as do women. And certainly after COVID with many people working from home, uh, being isolated having to watch children or care for children or doing their work while the kids were home and had to, you know, shuttle between computers and helping the kids get online and one self having to get online. It really demonstrated how the population in general, and I don't think this is just in the United States, but I think worldwide, how many people have been stressed and burned out during, you know, related to work and family. I think so. Jack, maybe you can add another question to that. I think when you uh, when um, Hans Graber talked about trauma in children and you know the effect of on depression and future mor mortality or morbidity and they talk about uh, physical health problems as well. But one of the things which came out is that resilience is so important. And uh, so the question is not do we just treat the depression or do we increase resilience? Because it seems that the tr and that people who have this type of resilience, whatever it is, it's a possibly a very difficult complex complex concept. But do these people have something? Um, how you call it? Uh, something different, or do they? Uh, right. Do they? How do they respond? Or what? What would their? Um, what would be? Yeah. their protective factors or would they respond differently or would they have the same physical health problems but don't have the, the anxiety yeah you know those you know prevention i think for many of us we see people who are late in life or they already have the illness and so we're treating the symptoms not the root cause uh, you know of the problem and similarly we don't really know some of the protective factors that keep people from coming to us. You know, we don't often see the, the people who are doing well in life and, you know, are happy and healthy. We're, we're usually seeing 
people who are ill in our practices. And so we have to learn and talk to behavioral scientists and others who really try to study this and what makes one resilient and able to cope. I, I was in the bank yesterday and I was late in the day and uh, there was uh, one man who was managing the um, drive-through as well as all the people who were online. And, you know, I was thinking, how is he managing this? And he was had a cheery face. He was calling people by name. You know, he he was very efficient, but he seemed happy. And I when I got to the, you know, to uh, and I was getting more and more annoyed because it was taking a long time, of course, and losing patience. When I got up to the to the front, I said, how could you, you know, what, what makes you so cheerful? And he says, you know, I've always been a happy-go-lucky person. You know, <laughs> this is me. And I think it points to what allows somebody like that. I mean, I certainly wasn't going to question him, but he was, you know, what allows certain people um, uh, to be like that? And what what can we learn from people who who are, who are like that? What makes people so resilient and, you know, able, able to withstand this? And I think, you know, certainly for many of us who, who work in hospitals and clinics, we don't, we're seeing, we're not getting to the root cause of these issues. We're seeing people when they already have major psychosocial issues in life and, you know, life is hard already and they already are sick. So I think your questions are very good. Okay, I think it's uh, no, Daria. Did you have another question then? Or you take over the chair. Um, 